Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 4, the week on Latin America. Uh, Professor Rios here. I hope you're doing well. Uh, before getting on to the lesson itself, like last week, I'll begin with a little bit of a Google Earth tour. So let's maximize that and get to it. So Latin America, if you are, if you are of Latin American background, that really means a lot of, that, that means different things to different people. So of course, Latin America, Hispanic America, however you want to call it, uh, refers primarily to areas where Spanish is the native language. Well, that's not entirely the case with this region because we have, of course, Brazil, where Portuguese is spoken. So per what your book has done is a basically taking everything from the U.S.-Mexico border. So California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. So Mexico, and then taking it all the way through Central America with the exception of Belize. They put that in the Caribbean. And the entirety of South America with the exception of Guyana, Suriname and French Guiana. And they consider these three countries part of the Caribbean. So they have an interesting sort of breakdown of how they view Latin America. As someone of Spanish background myself, I find it interesting because my family is from Puerto Rico originally. So I also think of this as Latin America, but your book doesn't. They just call it the Caribbean its own separate region and that's fine just it, it's really the most sort of spread out region it's not super connected other than through this little isthmus called panama and so it's a little bit different so let's begin by looking of course our southern neighbor mexico so mexico has a significant history as a function of the spanish uh, they've had influence in the United States, of course, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, and even parts of present day Wyoming used to belong to Spain, then Mexico, and now parts of the United States. So it's a super complicated, interesting history and geography. It's the reason why you find cities in Texas like San Antonio and Amarillo, which literally means yellow, if you didn't know that. Uh, of course, El Paso, Las Cruces, Santa Fe, and so on. So you definitely see the Spanish background or the Spanish influence in the border region between Mexico and the United States. Okay. Mexico has a very complicated geography itself. It has the Sierras on the east. A relatively high valley in the middle. And then, of course, the big Sierras out west. These are very, very tall mountains uh, out in the western provinces of Mexico. There is Baja California, where the Colorado River empties right through this region. There is the Colorado River Delta. By the time that river makes it there, it's barely a river worth walking across. It is basically almost spent of water as a function of all the dams that took place mainly in the United States. In fact, entirely in the United States. Uh, of course, Mexico has different areas. It has more Caribbean or more higher latitude, lower latitude, like the Yucatan, Campeche, Tabasco, Veracruz, Chiapas. These are places that are more tropical and more sort of tropical jungle in nature, uh, very, very flat. This area here is famous for being where the big asteroid that destroyed all the dinosaurs 65 million years ago fell right here, half in land, half in the water. So that's where it all happened a long, long time ago. Then you get into other Caribbean, Central American countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, uh, Costa Rica, Panama, before getting into, of course, South America. Different world, 
So I always find it interesting as a person who speaks Spanish, how different this Spanish is than the Spanish I know from Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic or even Cuba or Mexico. So once you cross into South America, of course, there are some very interesting geographical uh, features like the Andes. You have a continental plate right here colliding with an oceanic plate and that generates this 5,000 meter long chain of mountains which happens to be uninterrupted all the way from the hook called Tierra del Fuego, way down here at the southern tip of South America, literally pointing to the Antarctic, all the way to Colombia and Venezuela, over 5,000 kilometers away. And it really depends where you are, Ecuador, it's basically Spanish for equator. The equator goes right through Ecuador and the Amazonian forest. Of course, notice how the color goes from green on either side of the mountains to green on this side, brown on this side, and then eventually green on the west side and brown on the other side. These are all the different wind patterns that create either rain shadows on one side and heavy rain on the other, or heavy rain on the opposite side, rain shadow on the other side. Uh, it is a big controller of climate uh, across the region. Of course, if you are at the equator, you of course have the state of Amazonia, which is basically, um, uh, mostly uninterrupted forest jungle. Very few humans live here, okay? There are a few cities like Manaus and others really tiny settlements. But for the most part, this is one of the most, one of the least densely inhabited regions in the entire area of the world. Now, of course, as you get closer and closer to the coast, you see the effect of deforestation, which is a big deal in Brazil. And I think I may have shown you this in a previous Google Earth tour, but you see the difference that humans have made. You can see it from space. Everything that we have deforested looks lighter in color or brown because as rain falls, it washes away a lot of the soil. And of course, tropical rainforest takes a really long time to come back. And in the presentation, there's a really stark image that shows you what deforestation looks like next to actual tropical rainforest. All right, now as we head into Brazil. So Brazil, of course, the two big cities. Brazil is enormous. It is enormous, but the majority of people live in places like Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. All right, well, that being said, um, Brazil has some very interesting sort of cultural and ethnic remnants, if you want to call them. It has the most African background of any country on earth outside of Africa. It is where the majority of the slave trade went to, not the US, not the Caribbean, not Central America, Brazil. And as a result, there is a greater percentage of African background in Brazil as a result of that. Uh, so it's one of those sort of historical echoes. Uh, a couple of other things in here, you have the Atacama Desert, which is the driest place on earth. Um, some weather stations in this region, which could include Bolivia, Peru, and Chile, have never recorded rain. And by the way, the country of Chile, that's how you say it, Chile, not Chile, you visit it, you don't eat it. It's a pet peeve of mine, sorry. 
All right. Of course, you have a couple other things. You have the Amazon, the most voluminous river on Earth. It carries the most fresh water out of it. So much fresh water that you could be 60 miles out into the ocean. And if you take a cup and scoop up some water from the top of the ocean, it is more than likely mostly fresh water still. That's how much volume of water is coming out. Of course, you have some fascinating geographical features, including, in my opinion, one of the places, it's called the National Park, and I am going to screw this up, Maranhenses, I believe is how you say it, and it's an area that is all sand with lakes in those sand dunes. And the reason the lake don't drain is because the bottom is mostly clay. So you tend to have these amazing, in fact, let's see if I can look at some images here, where you look at some of the images, there it is, big sand dunes with lakes in them. These are freshwater lakes. Uh, and they don't drain particularly fast because the bottom of them, it's almost like they're lined with like a permanent barrier that prevents the water from seeping down very fast. It's a great tourist area that I really, really want to visit uh, at some point. It just looks amazing and it stretches for quite a distance in the northeastern portion of Brazil. So there is Latin America. Again, your definition of Latin America may not include or may include the Caribbean. That's not how the book does it. I would have done it that way, but hey, that's just me. Um, in this case, this will be chapter four and this will be chapter five or what we talk about next week. All right, so that's enough on the Google Earth. Let's look into the presentation itself. Let's minimize that. I'm having, uh, of course, I'm having computer issues. There we go. Ah, uh, technology. There you go. So let me maximize this. So Latin America, this image right here, I think it's about as iconic as it gets. It is Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro. It is probably one of the most iconic tourist locations on earth, let alone Brazil, let alone South America. Okay. So, you know, from this vantage point, you see Copacabana Beach, you see the area of Brazil that is most known. There is more to Rio than just this, obviously. So these are some of the learning objectives. And of course, some of the key concepts. So again, we already set the boundaries. Let's look at the map. Already sort of discussed this. Uh, there are plate tectonics that are part of this. There are conversion boundaries along the Mexico-Central American border, and of course, along the entire border of South America along the Western coast. Uh, it is definitely has a colonial landscape and background to it. It is highly urbanized with mega cities throughout, like Mexico City, like Lima, like Sao Paulo and Rio. Okay, so that's also a significant component of that. It's the idea of primate cities. They do exist in this part of the world. Uh, there is a tropical diversity of lands. So for example, the high plateau or the Bolivian Altiplano. It's literally a very, very high desert-like plain, which is essentially roughly where the tropical deserts are found in Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. 
It is also a very mineral rich region, which we discussed last week. It is part of what makes up a lot of your electronics, your Apple Watch, your iPhone, your Samsung Galaxy, your tablet. Okay. Uh, some of the environmental issues. Deforestation is one of the bigger deals. Uh, also, along with decertification, water and air pollution, uh, or others, climate change, like in any area of the world, is a big deal here. And deforestation is conducted for several reasons. Um, the cattle ranching industry and also people who simply want to grow food do so in a very disruptive way called slash and burn. So speaking of slash and burn, there is a video that is linked on your uh, class page called Up in Smoke. It's about an eight, nine minute presentation. It's actually from uh, PBS's um, nightly news show, and it's called Up in Smoke, Combating Deforestation and offering possible solutions to it. It's a bit dated now, but it's still rather applicable and is actually very well done. But it gives you a sense of what the people in that area go through. Uh, and so I highly recommend you watch it. This is again, I already showed you imagery, but here's one from 1975 and one from 2009. This is the area of Brazil that is most susceptible to it called Rondonia. Uh, it so happens that it's sort of in between any further north, it would be truly Amazonian jungle. Anything closer south, it's probably too dry during the dry season. So this is an area that is somewhat ideal for this kind of stuff. And here's that image I wanted to show you. That is what tropical jungle looks like on the left. That is what deforestation actually looks like. So this really looks like this from close to the ground. Um, that is a completely reinvented landscape, completely reinvented landscape. Uh, and it's hard. It takes a long time for this to be recreated just because you leave it blank. It doesn't come back to what you think it will. It takes a long time for tropical jungles to reestablish themselves as you see on the left side of the image. Uh, part of this is called grassification, the conversion of that tropical forest for beef production. So this, you can have herds of cattle here. You can't on this side. Okay, it's a reinvention of land, not unlike what the US and Canada have done to what used to be called the prairie. There is no prairie left in the United States or Canada for that matter. It doesn't exist. What exists now in the US and Canada is a whole bunch of wheat, corn, whey, and other crops that are grown in rectangles or circles. So it's been a completely reinvented landscape over the past, you know, 150 to 200 years. Other environmental issues, there's an area to the north, this is in Venezuela called Lake Maracaibo uh, and the Caratumbo River. It is the lightning capital of the world with 300 days of lightning during the year. Uh, it's a function of the water there, the heat, content of that water and the geography of the land. It's like a big teardrop. And as a result, it produces more lightning than anywhere else on Earth. Yes, this is like almost 200 more days a year than Florida. So that gives you a sense of how much lightning we're talking about. Uh, other environmental concerns, for example, severe air pollution, whether it would be Mexico City here, Here's the big giant volcano to the west or Santiago, Chile, which is bound on its eastern 
side by the Andes Mountains. And these are really, really, really tall mountains, as high as 20,000 feet in elevation. All righty. Again, some of the other features. Again, the Andes is either 4,500 4, um, miles or over 5,000 kilometers, however you want to think of it. So in terms of rivers, there are really only three main river sheds. Of course, they are significant. The Amazon, the Orinoco, which is up here in Colombia and Venezuela, and the Plata, which is in Brazil, Bolivia, Uruguay, and Argentina. And as a result, you tend to have, uh, like in China or the United States, there is a Itai the Itaipu Dam, which is fantastic from the purpose of clean energy and reservoir uh, capacity, but also has its negative consequences. Like any dam that's built, there is good with bad. Uh, and you can think of the bad as, you know, you displace people, they lost their homes, cultural landscapes may have been inundated, uh, environmental issues that are really unforeseen as of yet. Or you have free energy or very cheap energy. Uh, and of course, you have flood control slash um, reservoir capacity. So there is good and bad. Uh, the Andes present this very unique environmental feature into the landscape and it's called altitudinal zonation. That is simply because of elevation, and I, I love how they put it in Spanish, hot land, temperate land, cold land, frozen land. And it's just a function of how quickly your environment can change with a simple change in elevation. And you don't have to go very far to experience this. Okay, and you can kind of see it in the image here Santiago, Chile is a tropical place, yet not that far you have this, snow. Why? Because these are really, really tall mountains. And looking at climate, there you see the fact that it is a variety of climates. The only climate that is not found in South America and the Southern Hemisphere would be um, the climate of... Um, Declimate. You do not find declimates. Notice A climates, B, C, E climates, and of course highland climates in that area called the Altiplano, which is roughly about here. And notice how the H climate is observed everywhere from Chile, Argentina, all the way north into Brazil, I mean Colombia and Venezuela course, a big swath of tropical rainforest. And then here in that region that can that turns into AW or tropical savanna, this is where the deforestation is roughly taking place. All right, let's see. Here's some a visual look at climates of the region. This is, of course, uh, at the very, very southern tip of Argentina. This is called uh, Perito Moreno. It is an interesting glacier because it's ice and there's a forest immediate, immediately next to it. Uh, but this is at the very southern end of Argentina. Of course, you have the Amazon. This is probably the most iconic uh, region, um, iconic place, if you want to think of it, in all of South America. I mean, you have to think of it in terms of there are probably areas here where no humans have ever set foot in, even right now. And there may be pockets of indigenous people here who have never, ever, ever had any contact with modern day humans, ever. So pretty remarkable. Of course, the Atacama, very dry. So from very dry 
to very wet to very cold. Uh, and of course, the area is no more, no less susceptible to climate change than anywhere else. Agriculture and glacial retreat are tied together because as you lose water in the form of ice mass, you lose the ability to rely on that snow melt on an annual basis. If it's gone, it's gone. Of course, population is, as I always like to say, one of the biggest issues in any region. And in this region, urban primacy is dominant. So let's look at that. Fertility rates in urban, percent urban, percent urban is quickly increasing and fertility rates are quickly dropping. Uh, there is not one single country anymore in the entirety of the region that is growing fast. Everybody has switched from a stage two to a stage three on their way to stage four and five. So this is a remarkable change over one generation. So we're talking about since about the mid nineties to now. So populations, for example, and again, this is in two, uh, 1994, El Salvador was a decided stage two, growing quickly, very big base at the bottom in 2019, stage four, two to four in one generation. Here is to compare the US, Canada, and Mexico in 2020. Mexico is at a stage three, we are at a stage four, Canada is at a stage five. They are quickly headed in this direction, and we will eventually get to that. That's just one of those population certainties. So that's comparing Latin America to Southern America, uh, to North America rather, since they're essentially connected. Uh, from the perspective of typical American city layouts, it is very standard. It reflects the colonial origin, mostly Spanish. Okay. And you can see how, for example, Mexico City, it has significant Spanish influence. There's usually, this is in the middle of the city, the big, big Mexican flag, a big, big, basically plaza with a church that's very prominent. And as a result, you have this very distinctive sort of look. And you would find this in other uh, Latin American cities, like, for example, Panama or Uruguay, maybe to a lesser extent, because those are smaller uh, cities. But still, you find the same general Spanish influence uh, throughout the region, and even in the Caribbean, frankly, to some extent. There are informal sectors to a lot of these settlement places, and we'll, we'll mainly discuss the idea of a favela. And a favela is a organically grown, non-planned community that is attached to the planned, more well-structured and developed region. So here's one in Caracas. Here's one in Sao Paulo. And of course, in Brazil, here is one. There is another. And there is another one right there. And you might think, well, this is already in the city. Well, they're really not. There's nine of them in Rio alone. Uh, and there's a great video, by the way. I highly recommend you watch them. In fact, the videos looking at the favelas and looking at the Olympics in Brazil kind of gives you a sense of how these communities known as favelas function almost as independent little places within the city itself, almost independently so. So another thing about the Olympics, and this is part of your homework and your discussion for this week is the idea of whether developing places like Brazil should ever host the Olympics again. And I say this because Brazil is probably the last developing state that will host an Olympics for quite a while. 
uh, the Olympics were remarkably expensive and they did not deliver what was promised for the people, the regular people. So a lot of money was spent. And to give you a sense of how I think they're never going to be hosted at a developing country, at least for a very long time, the 2024 games were awarded to France, Paris. The 2028 games were awarded to Los Angeles. Each of those cities has hosted the Olympics twice already. And in fact, in July of 2021, the 2032 games were awarded without competition to the country of Australia. Nobody even bid. Australia was the only one that wanted them. So there is no longer a big rush to bid for these games because a lot of countries realize they tend to be big money pits. So anyway, that's part of your discussion for this week. Here's the idea of growth, international flows in and out. And some of the movements, and for the most part, they tend to be rural to urban migration movements. The idea of transnationalism, the, the links of economics between home and host countries, and the idea of remittances, which is monies that are sent home by people working in different places. There is, of course, great cultural and historical diversity in the region. Remember, this region is home to the Aztec culture, Maya culture, Inca culture, long, long, long before colonialism. Of course, the slave trade played a big role in Central and South America, with the majority of it going into what we refer to as present day Brazil. And in there, not only do you have the African legacy, but you also have the Portuguese legacy. Here's the idea of blending culture. So this is, you know, um, a church in Latin America that not only has a lot of native look to it, but is also very Roman Catholic. So it blends different aspects of religion and local culture, native culture into the architecture, for example. Right. And then, of course, when you look at individuals like these, they look more native or indigenous to the area, even though they may speak Spanish and they could be from Peru or Ecuador or Bolivia or Chile. Uh, so there is sort of like this interesting look when you think of Hispanic people, they can be white, blonde, blue eyed, they can be very, very dark. They can be somewhere in between. They can have indigenous heritage in them. So it is a great cultural diversity and ethnic diversity within what we term Hispanic or Latin America. All right, so we'll look at some of these, some of these churches, like if you're from the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico or Venezuela, or anywhere in the, in the Caribbean or Latin America, frankly, this is what you tend to find. And they look very familiar. They look very unique, very uniquely Latin American. Uh, you wouldn't find this in Europe, other than maybe Spain, I suppose. You wouldn't find them in, you know, places in Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, where Christianity is strong. You find this as a function of the Mex Spanish, and Portuguese influence in the region. Again, there is that the interactions, European, African, and indigenous populations leads to all this sort of mixing up of different aspects of language, identity, religion. It's a very complex ethnic pattern. Again, these are where different languages are spoken. Of course, Spanish and Portuguese dominate, but there's lots of other local native small pocket of languages spoken throughout the region. Again, how Latin America changed from the 
the time of Spanish conquistadores and the Portuguese to Latin America with independence to the Latin America that we know today. Okay. So that's sort of how I prefer you sort of view uh, the whole idea. Okay. There are in present day or modern day Latin America, of course, there are trade blocks and supranational organizations. These are organizations that are multinational or subnational organizations that are more inward looking. So these are more outward looking connections between Mexico and, and other parts of South America with maybe the United States and Canada. And of course, those organizations that think more locally and internally. So inside of Peru or inside of Bolivia or so on. Okay. Of course, the drug trade is a big deal in this region. Uh, and oftentimes it may not originate in Mexico, but Mexico, it's on its way to the U.S., which happens to be, frankly, one of the bigger demanders of the drug product. So there are flows of drugs from Asia or from Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, through Mexico and along border states. And that's problematic. Let's see, let's look at, of course, Latin America and the global economy. One of the biggest parts of it is the expanded Panama Canal which happened in 2016. The Panama Canal goes back decades and decades, but this connected many different areas of the world that would otherwise be really far from one another. So the United States built the Panama Canal. It has since given it to um, Panama itself, who now controls it and maintains it. Uh, but it's the idea of being able to go from the Caribbean or the Atlantic side into the Pacific side without having to go around the entire South American continent, which would be really long, really expensive, and really dangerous. Okay, so that's kind of a big deal in that area. These are the human um, economic and social development um, figures for each of the countries. Again, you can see the variety and the discrepancy in gross national income and the difference, the higher this number, the more developed a country is. So you're talking about Chile, Argentina as the two most developed places in Latin America. And of course, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras as the least. And you can see, of course, gender inequality and other such things like, for example, males versus females in school viewed as a significant aspect of that human development index. All right. So that is what I have for you. Uh, this is what I wanted to address in the lesson. Again, make sure you cover the videos that are linked on the class page. Um, folk, make sure that you refer to them for discussion in the weekly discussion forum and otherwise i hope you have a great uh week if you have any questions please let me know bye